My name is Alexis Richardson. I'm the founder and CEO of a company that does a product called Weave, uh, which is a Docker network and soon to be other things as well, which I'm here to talk about today. Um, previously, I was involved in a project called RabbitMQ that some of you may have used, and uh, I work out of London, not far from here. So Justin's, talk, Justin's presentations are all today themed around operating systems, and I've decided to focus on questions about operating systems in my talk. Um, I hope you find it fun and uh, see, what, see where it takes us. So first of all, let me just tell you a little bit about Weave just to get this out of the way. Uh, it is a network technology today. It's a software-defined network. Somebody called it Nisera for hipsters or software-defined networking for hipsters. Basically, a really lightweight, easy-to-use solution to the Docker networking problem. It allows you to network containers, or in fact, things that aren't containers, uh, anywhere across any kind of cloud, um, multi-hop, partially connected networks, you can secure it. Lots of neat features, but the main thing is it's dead easy to use. So, you know, the main thing is um, we did it because Docker didn't actually have a multi-host networking <coughs> solution at the time, and now we're very much involved, along with some other companies, in working with Docker towards uh, new kinds of networking for Docker. Um, so watch this space. I believe there may maybe some announcements next week at DockerCon. And here are some links to check out if you're interested in following up on, on Weave. What's interesting about Weave from a technology perspective, and that's really what I want to focus on in this talk. First of all, it's 100% decentralized. Uh, everything in the design does not require any kind of consensus or coordination or agreement. It's all based on asynchronous techniques and very, very scalable indeed. Secondly, uh, and this is really important, the APIs are things that you already know. We don't think it's very easy to use new technology when it requires you to believe that it will work and requires you to learn a new API. Sometimes, as with somebody saying earlier on Gear D, I think it was one, Kubernetes and other, the technology is changing all the time and you don't know whether the API is actually going to even be useful tomorrow. So we think it's very important to adhere to best practice maybe even decades of best practice when it comes to the types of technologies you should use. And so with our network, not only is it a layer two IP network operating as a virtual switch, but also service discovery has a DNS interface so you can already use it. And we're currently working on address allocation which will have a DHCP based model, actually d 2 hcp because it's decentralized. And this enables us to say the following about our technology which is that not only does it help you to solve a problem, it then gets out of your way. It doesn't constantly trip you up with uh, reminders that it's there, trying to get you to do things differently from how you're used to doing them. And we believe this solves the, possibly the widest range of problems as a result. And so the question then arises, what else can you do in this way? Maybe you could build a whole operating system or platform like this. But before we look at that, let's go back in time it's now 2014, so let's go back to 1994, 20 years ago. The first real attempt to do portable and distributed computing uh, by Sun Microsystems, who you may remember. Some of you seem to be old enough to remember Sun. Um, some of you even worked at Sun, I think. Where's Finton? Anyway. Um, it was a lingua franca for distributed computing but it took off as a source of uh, technology for web applications. But the distributed computing problems were not actually you know, hidden. They, they were there all the time. And it, the, the people who made Java wrote down what they called the fallacies of distributed computing at the same time to remind themselves primarily and then secondarily, you guys, what can go wrong when you build an application on a network using distributed technology, possibly using Java? I'm not gonna go into great length, but some of you may have seen this before. You know, the killers are, of course, things like latency. If you are running a, making network calls, it really matters if you're making them over a network or not. That can profoundly affect how your system behaves. There are also things called partitions, which nobody gets right if you're running a uh, large-scale system. So I'm not going to, can't go on. Actually, just one point about that. I say it's seven plus one myths because one was added later by James Gosling who wrote down the first seven with some other people. He added it in 1997. 
So what happened with Java? Well, Java tried very hard to solve enterprise computing problems, i.e. to sell to businesses. And businesses said they wanted safety, guarantees, reliability. They weren't so interested in productivity at the time. They were really just interested in IT being safe. Now, if you think that businesses today fear IT, you should have seen what it was like in 1994. They were absolutely terrified of technology, and they really thought IT people should hide in the back office. It, you know, it was the IT crowd, but, but you know, on a massive scale. So these platforms, which were J2EE platforms, were really there to make the IT crowd go away and be replaced by some software that you could buy from IBM or BEA or Oracle or Sun, a J2EE application server. And what they tried to do was hide all the complexity of distributed computing inside the platform, which turned out to be a bad idea because it encouraged people to use features that were baked into the app server that they'd been told to use by the boss, like distributed transactions and all other kinds of coordination solution, which turn out to have unforeseen effects on your application. Essentially, the downsides of hiding complexity is that it bites you later. So let's please not do this again. So coming back to the present day, some things have changed since 1994. First of all, uh, we now have what appears to be more or less ubiquitous and cheap physical computing infrastructure. We have all kinds of clouds. Um, not all of this compute infra will be Amazon. I think they're one or two percent of the world's servers, Google, something like that too. But it is cheap, and it means that some of the problems, you know, if not, haven't exactly gone away, but have been somewhat mitigated. For example, administration. You know, for the, from the point of view of an end user, a cloud is almost a zero admin solution. So the nature of the problems has changed a little. But some of them haven't gone away. I mean, latency, as I mentioned, is still a big one. And anything to do with system integrity, whether it's identity or consistency, it's really going to bite you if you're not aware of moving parts in your application. But one thing has changed recently that I think is very important, and it's actually something we are, oops, betting a company on. Well, there we go. And you'll see people saying, ha, 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 docker, 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 docker. Well, here you go. Oh, dear. It's taken over my computer. <laughs> and it's getting louder. And it's getting louder. And you can't ignore it. And we're not ignoring it. So what is the profound change that has occurred? I think, and you may disagree, that the most important thing that Docker has done and it's going to change a lot of things, is it actually has finally got development and operations to agree on something, which is what you ship when you ship software. And that, in turn, is going to have tons and tons of repercussions for tooling, for practice, and for applications themselves. It will also have implications in terms of the scale of automation that you can achieve. So Google this summer said, we start two billion containers a week. You probably saw that. That was Joe Beto. It was quite widely reported. If that statement is true and representative of all of Google, uh, Google own about 1% of the world's servers, so that means that if a bunch of obvious assumptions, everybody turned into Google overnight, we would all be starting at 10 trillion containers a year. That's a lot of containers. It's a lot more than there are software developers, which is you know, 10 or 20 million. So automation is another profound consequence of people starting to adopt containerized technology. And recently, just in the last few weeks, Docker have started to unveil their plans for the future. And this is going back to our theme about the new operating system, because Docker no longer wants to be just what you ship when you ship software, the image chassis, if you will, the interface between the software and the machine. They also want to be a distributed application platform. Where have we seen this before? This could be a new operating system. I wrote a blog about it a couple of weeks ago, which might amuse you. It's on link to that. So new Docker, a new Weave, and now we've lost it again because Docker is in charge of my computer. There we go. Okay, so let's look at those fallacies again and maybe come up with some new fallacies or myths for the new era of the new OS and see, see if we can have some fun while we're doing it, see where it takes us and maybe motivate ourselves to do some future work. So here we go. Myth number one. It used to be the case, I think, that in most enterprise customers I would talk to, that one team would be responsible for building and shipping operating systems and installing them on machines and looking after them and patching and maintaining them. 
And then there'd be, there'd be these other teams called app dev that deployed applications onto those operating systems with the permission of the, of the operations team. And they might deploy multiple applications, possibly in VMs, possibly not, and they might get rid of them. But the two life cycles were separate. Well, that's changing. This should be fairly obvious to most of you guys, but I thought I'd put it in here anyway. I'm going to quote from somebody that I know. Some, some, of you may, some of you may know him, Neil Ellis, a technology consultant based in Brighton. After Docker, many of us are starting to look at things in a different way. Our apps are now the same as machines, thanks to Docker. This means our applications can act like they once did as the sole piece of software running on a machine. So this means that suddenly the life cycle collapses down to that of the container itself. And the OS and the app and the container can coexist as a single set of purpose-built tools. That completely changes the relationship between more or less every process in IT. It's a very interesting consequence. It also means that some things like you know, microkernels and unikernels, Maddo's talk from earlier, um, become more important. I'd definitely like to see more of that myself. It also means containers can be short-lived. One day we'll see containers that manage a single transaction and then die. Myth number two. New applications are typically distributed applications, meaning that if you go and talk to the developers who are writing them, and ask them to draw a picture of their app, they'll draw you a diagram on the board instead of a layered cake like they used to in the 90s. In the 90s, you used to say, pick your database, pick your app server, pick your web server, off you go, because you're building a, you know, a bookstore or something like that. Nowadays, it's all much more um, heterogeneous, and systems are typically distributed, running in the cloud, lots of components, and so forth, microservices, blah, blah, blah. Is it true that you need a panoply of new tools and skills for this? No, it is not true because of that comment that Neil made. And here's more Neil, because I, I love his comment so much. The side effect of this unity of applications and machines is older and low-level technologies are suddenly relevant again. So some of you may have come across an abomination called UDDI. There's other directory services interfaces too, like LDAP. We can go back to using DNS now. We don't have to worry about application serv servers. We can actually use load balancing on our containers. Isn't that just marvelous? It's certainly easier, which means we've gone back even further than 1994 in some cases, but in a good way. So that means that uh, we actually don't have to learn a ton of new stuff. And that also means that applications don't have to be fundamentally rewritten, nor can we, can we, do we have to throw out all of our operational tooling. We can go back to the ops team, or if we're in the ops team, we can cheer, because actually we can carry on using the monitoring system we were using yesterday a lot of the time should be able to. So that's the reality there. And that means we can actually start thinking about a composable runtime, a bit like Unix, but for the container era, which consists of a set of services that work in that way, that are aligned with that philosophy and that way of doing things. I mentioned network service discovery and DHCP. What else is there? All in all, that will make it much easier to refactor and migrate applications because you're not constantly grappling with a platform that's fighting against you. And in particular, many platforms that you will see seem to be saying to me, and perhaps I'm wrong in thinking this, but they seem to be saying, hey, the platform is better at building your app than you are. This is obviously rubbish. Most of the time, the developer knows what they're doing, how to build an app and how to manage it. <coughs> Opinionated platforms, so, as so-called, are certainly useful in special cases, but one thing that they can't ever be is completely general purpose tools that make you instantly productive in every use case. Otherwise, they couldn't possibly be opinionated. And that, in turn, means that a general purpose system in the new era for the new operating system has to be unopinionated. It has to enable and then get out of your way, which is something that we think we're trying, going to try to do. The next myth, myth number five, is related to the previous one, which is that you know, not only do you want to have an opinionated system, but you also need an all-inclusive system, because obviously there must be things that you haven't thought of yet that the system's got to support already, otherwise you're doomed. Often this is used to justify high price of products. When I talk to customers, they don't want an all-inclusive system. What they want is they want adaptability, 
and pluggability, because they've learned from what they were told with app servers, we can do everything, and they know that there's going to be different use cases which need to be supported in different ways. They don't trust vendors who come along and say, you've got to learn all about our platform and go on a course, and you've got to have consultants install it before you can actually get using it. And they also require whatever tools they use, whether they're platforms or components or systems, to be pluggable in the, in, in the sense of allowing their own systems to be introduced into the, uh, into the platform. For example, their own monitoring, their own logging, et cetera. This is critically important to enterprise customers. That's why they don't like the one-size-fits-all solutions. So the idea that these are best is absolutely a myth. It's also why I like Amazon's model of an infrastructure as a service combined with a lot of useful little services. And why I think Netflix open source should really be called Netflix operating system. Myth number six. I hear people saying that, oh, Fig. Fig's great for dev test, but you wouldn't use it in production. Well, I think this is a load of crap, too. I think that really good tools scale all the way through from dev test in, into production. Good tools are location invariant. They run anywhere in the same way, more or less. They're scale invariant. They should scale from laptop to cloud. This is what you want and what people can need. And Weave Network tries to you know, exemplify that in the case of networks. Anything that should be a standard new operating system should really adhere to the same philosophy, I think. By the way, talking of uh, scaling, uh, apparently Docker have reintroduced images into their build for Docker library. That means that you're downloading 800 megabytes of images again. So please get rid of that, Docker. And myth number seven, um, coordination. You know, one of the things that app servers did, I mentioned earlier, was they had transactions as a sort of standard feature of the platform and kind of subtly or not so subtly encouraged application developers to use them, which led to spaghetti code that didn't scale and didn't work. Things like transactions should really be in the hands of the application designer and not something that's hidden inside the platform. It's a myth to say that things like consensus and other more modern forms of coordination should be in the platform. You ain't going to use it half the time. Systems should instead be like the internet, as decentralized as possible, as partition tolerant as possible, able to root around failures and look for alternatives themselves. You don't want the semantics of important things like transactions somehow taken care of by the platform. And the last myth, uh, which of course is a joke, I'm not seriously thinking that anybody thinks this, but uh, yeah, we're certainly very keen on Docker, and this is not meant in any way as an insult, but it is something I hear a lot, that people think just because somebody's figured out a standard model for images and is starting to build out a platform means that a whole lot of other things will somehow solve themselves. They just won't. And those distributed competing fallacies are not going to go away either. So here's the recap. I hope you found these to be a fun and possibly useful set of new myths. Um, maybe they need to be rewritten. Feel free to make your own up. Um, what does it mean for us with Weave? I'd like to thank Justin, the organizer, for helping me with the title of this slide. Um, what we're trying to do with Weave is help you make the faff disappear, but not in a way that it's actually invisible, just in a way that it's, it's done, broken up into smaller parts that are easier to use. We would like to have a composable system on the principles of Unix, but solving runtime problems in the set, as a set of services for distributed applications using containers, so that you as the user can go, right, I'm installing Docker, I'm installing Weave, now I know I can build something. I may need to use an orchestration system, I may need to use Kubernetes, I may need to use CloudSoft, I may need to use Fig, dot, 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 or I can do it myself in the way that I'm used to. And you can mix in your own pieces to taste. And we think that's an interesting thing to do. We think it's interesting and important to try and stick to existing interfaces and not throw new APIs at you. Let's see how far we can take it. And for those of you who are inclined to contribute to open source projects, here are some challenges that you can think about at 2 a.m. Um, how to do logging in a distributed setting is an interesting challenge. How to do access control that is completely decentralized is a very interesting challenge. And of course, distributed load balancing and proxying is, a, is an area of active research. And there's, there's lots more as well. So get in touch. And let's build it together. Thank you very much.
We made the decision to use Go for everything. Um, this is because Go is the uh, standard uh, language of choice in the Docker community. It is not because we think Go is the best programming language, or the worst, or any such thing. It's just because other people use it in that way. We've actually had good experiences with Go. That's a talk for someone else to do on another day. Another question, yes? Uh, it does. There are actually, Weave at the moment is in two parts. Um, there is software that's written in Go, which provides um, one of the services that I mentioned, such as routing, uh, DNS, and so forth. Um, there's also uh, shell scripts that are actually bash scripts, which are there to make the Docker experience completely seamless. And the CLI is like a Docker CLI. It's documented on, on, the, on GitHub. <laughs> 